everyone. Welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Rafa Iqbal, and in today's show, we'll be discussing upon uh, two topics that will uh, circle around our, our discussion. The first segment uh, will be Pakistan's uh, talks uh, with the IMF, as of course we know that a new finance minister has been sworn in, there's a new government in place, and of course, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif was sworn in, he signaled towards immediate talks with the IMF, and the first step towards that was uh, the appointment of a finance minister, and of course, that as uh, that is now in place, Mohammed Aurangzeb has been sworn in as the finance minister of the country, and he has also signaled to begin a talks with the IMF uh, this week, and that will also uh, be that will also be regarding the completion of the second review under the standby arrangement uh, that was uh, that earlier Pakistan secured in the PDM stint when uh, Shahbaz Sharif was uh, the prime minister, and he had also put in a lot of efforts regarding uh, the the standby arrangement as well. And of course, uh, there's also a talk regarding a fresh medium-term bailout package, and of course, that will be the extended fund facility. Uh, regarding the second segment, uh, we'll be talking about the Gaza situation and the ceasefire there. Of course, as we know, it's the 158th day. If you talk about the number of casualties, there's uh, more than 30,000 um, people that have been killed. There's more than 71,000 that have been injured. And of course, um, as, as the war, Israel's war on Gaza and on the Palestinian enclave began, uh, we saw there was massive protests all around the world. There was global condemnation, even in Europe and the Arab world. And we saw that uh, there was a lot of resistance from all over the world uh, regarding Israel's uh, war on Gaza and the atrocities it is committing there. And of course, um, uh, we'll also uh, talk about how Israel has been restricting aid in uh, Gaza and the besieged enclave. And of course, uh, how the United Nations had also, uh, the Security Council has also passed a resolution regarding uh, the, uh, the uh, provision of uh, assistance, humanitarian assistance to uh, the Gazan population. And of course, uh, we will also, uh, we saw that South Africa had moved a case in the International Court of Justice against Israel's genocidal acts. And of course, uh, now as we talk about the ceasefire, um, there's uh, US, the United States, there's Qatar, and Egypt that is mediating for a ceasefire between the two parties. Now, to start off our conversation, uh, we'll uh, move uh, towards uh, the first topic first, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the, uh, the panel of analysts that we have in the studios. We have senior analyst Farouk Patafi, Along with that, we have been joined by geopolitical analyst Raja Faisal. And of course, on Skype, we have been joined by our guest, Dr. Khakan Najib, who is an economist. And we'll start off our conversation from the first topic, that is Pakistan's talks with the IMF. As of course, we know that a new government is in place. There's a new finance minister in place, Mohammad Aurangzeb, and he has signaled immediate talks with the IMF. Uh, Dr. Khakan, uh, what's your take? As we know, Shahbaz Sharif, as his stint as Prime Minister in the PDM government, he put in a lot of efforts to secure the standby arrangement, and now Mohammad Aurangzeb has also signaled talks with the IMF. How crucial are these talks going to be, and what are the challenges Mohammad Aurangzeb will be facing, and uh, the, the points that he needs to be deliberating on in the negotiations with the IMF? So if you go back a few months, Sometime early July, we started the standby arrangement at a very precarious time when the reserves had fallen to nearly three billion. There were uh, talks of default in the country, and the you know rupee was gyrating against the dollar, against all other currencies. Um, the prices were going up, and then we had the IMF program, and of course the current PM uh, made a lot of effort, and it was a PDM effort altogether, which got them the program, which is a standby arrangement. It's not a full-fledged program. It's a facility which kind of help the interim time, you know, pass. We had to um, get about $25 billion. And without the IMF umbrella, that would have been difficult. Um, so uh, we did the first review. The second review, which is based on December targets, um, which I think mostly are met. Um, and because this was a standby arrangement, it largely hinged upon pricing changes. For example, on February 15th, we had to review the gas price we did. It relied on the energy sector, um, um, uh, power sector pricing changes, the pass-throughs of the petroleum products. Uh, then it hinged upon our keeping the rupee exchange rate parity um, um, right. Then it hinged upon getting all the other financials in place, um, some new um, taxation and some enforcement and making sure the tax targets were being met. 
So largely, I think we are in the ballpark. We should be able to get the second review done by some time end of next week, if we speak. Um, if the mission was to start in a, um, a day or two, um, the the review should be completed by a, end of next week, and we should be going to the board sometime after that. Um, I think staff level agreement would be fairly um, comfortably reached. Uh, so that's a good omen for Pakistan. We get the 1.2 billion dollars, but you know it's. Uh, after that, that uh, we have to see, you know, the most sobering picture of Pakistan. Um, we'll be looking towards the IMF for a 24th facility in 76 years of our existence. You know, before we embark on this, uh, we should do some introspection as to what have we done in the 76 years that we are going to the um, doctor of the ICU 24th time. You know, if we were an individual, um, and if we were to look at ourselves, and if I was going to the ICU every now and then, I'm sure all three of you would ask me, do you not, you know, exercise? Do you not eat properly? Do you have a tense mind? Do you, you know, w w what is the issue with you? Do you not follow the medical procedures? So, you know, I think that's the kind of diagnostic introspection um, on the fiscal, on the monetary, on our exports, on our regulations, on our SOEs, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, we really need to do. And overall, on our, on our economic governance, on our energy sector, we, we really need to think what have we done to the country where we are, you know, right now even tied to the fact that the next year's $25 billion would not be possible without the IMF umbrella. Um, something else we must consider, um, and I've been saying this for a while, that the geostrategic rents that we've had for a long time um, which have kind of, you know, um, I, I think kept us away from being competitive. Uh, if we didn't have those, I think we would have been competing in the world for our exports. We would have been, you know, making that effort. Uh, and IMF also has been a moral hazard in a sense. You know, we've come near default, we've been rescued. Um, and then the way we've done the IMF program overall, um, the next program before we, you know, strike a deal uh, um, with the IMF, we should really, really think that this is not an IMF program. This is Pakistan's program that we are signing for an extended fund facility with the IMF. Um, and, you know, this on-off kind of treatment, rollbacks, half-hearted implementation, um, we really need to give up all these bad habits. Uh, these are the bad habits uh, which have gotten us here. Um, and that's the real uh, um, introspection I think we should do. Uh, and this is not pertinent to any particular uh, time period. I think that's been our story. 2013-16 um, remain to be the only program we completed. Uh, PMLN was in government. You are, I remember because I was, you know, a main part of that program. Um, uh, so writing the next program itself is going to be a very challenging um, task. Um, that introspection would help a lot. Um, that would tell us that what were our mistakes um, and what have been our fundamental issues. Um, and then, you know, treat IMF as. Uh, a lender, uh, someone who's going to finance a program that you're going to put together. Um, I think that's my most sobering uh, thought for the day. Right, uh, as you mentioned that uh, there's, there's um, we, as we have gone, uh, gone to the IMF many times and there's, there's some, there must be some reason that uh, we, we're not being able to come out of the challenges that the country has been facing. Um, uh, what, in your opinion, are the, should be the primary objectives of these negotiations and negotiations with the IMF? Um, considering uh, the, the second review of the standby arrangement and as we're also hearing talks of the extended fund facility, um, what's the key areas that Pakistan could focus on regarding negotiations with the IMF so we can better chalk out a strategy of how we're going to implement uh, policies and frameworks regarding the future course of action? And uh, with your permission, Rafi, I, I just want to actually add to this. Dr. Sahib, let me rearrange the question and also uh, the earlier question actually. Mm. What is mm. going to be the biggest challenge for the cu current uh, finance minister? Uh, is it uh, uh, because we know that IMF is a means to an end? Um, the question is which one will uh, actually be the biggest task? Mm. Is it inflation? Is it uh, you know shrinking economy? Or then actually setting uh, the m uh, market or economic fundamentals co correct hmm. uh, and I particularly mean macroeconomic stabilization could you actually shed light on which one is the most important priority beyond IMF dialogue 
Dr. Farhan. Uh, IMF should move to. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, Dr. Yes. The way you have put it is the right way to think about it. IMF should be uh, approached sparingly. Uh, we haven't approached them sparingly, but that's how the countries should. And they should be approached to create a breathing sp uh, a space or a breathing room to implement the policies that restore economic stability and balance uh, because they do your pricing adjustments and the other adjustments to make sure that you shore up your reserves, to make sure that your deficits um, or your leakages are controlled. But the underlying, you know, um, 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 uh, the underlying causes of the symptoms that they are treating are still there. So you've rightly said, you go to the IMF, you you adhere to the adjustments that you agree with them, um, and that's fine. Um, and, uh, you know, treat them as good adjustments. Um, some of them um, would, of course, uh, raise tariffs. Some of them would raise um, policies on the taxation. Um, but, you know, do something different this time. And, you know, here's uh, my second take. You, you know, I've always said that going to the IMF is a must. My second take is don't go to the IMF without good preparation. Um, you know, as if you are going to buy property in the world, I don't know if they say this in Pakistan, but they say three things while you're buying property. Um, and the three things are number one, location, number two, location, number three, location. Um, on, on IMF, this is what I say to countries, and I've said this to another country, I'm going to repeat. Number one, preparedness. Number two, preparedness. Number three, preparedness. So prepare your own thinking um, as to what, what, what do you want to see at the end of the three years with the IMF. So first of all, that gives you clarity that you're going to stay with them, the three-year program that you sign with them. What, and if you start thinking like that, um, then also believe that uh, you want to tackle the real sector. So, Patafi sahab, uh, uh, the real sector challenges, um, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's um, in the exports, whether it's in the agriculture. So, you're trying to challenge the real sector um, um, rent seeking. You're you're trying to overcome the hurdles. So, as much work you can do within the pro program framework on the real sector. Um, that is what is going to bring down your inflation. The productivity ideas, the deregulation ideas. Uh, so, so do them. Again, with the real sector, the, the other challenge would be how do you solve your energy rise of prices? Um, and I say you solve the energy rise in prices by doing your administrative rethink on the energy sector. I mean, would you have discos in the private hands? Would you have Genco's in the private hands? Would you have a tariff which is not similar in Hyderabad and Multan and Lahore and Karachi and Quetta? Um, and then you go and tell the people, right now you give 170 billion rupees tariff differential subsidy. And the reason you give that is so you're equalizing um, the you know fault lines. You, if one disco is bleeding, you, you give them money to, to, to come at equal price. So, you know, get out of that business. Let them compete. If... Uh, uh, you know, a city is doing bad, then the people would go to um, that disco and pressurize them that why is uh, that B city has a lower tariff because they have uh, less line losses. Please, you know, get your um, um, house in order. So, so start thinking much more deeper. Now, when you start thinking like that, so these are my top two challenges. Then um, my third challenge wouldn't even be um, FPR. Um, it would be expenditure, actually. Um, the reason for that is that, you know, this is a new government. Uh, it's a coalition government. There is a strong opposition um, and people are hurting. Um, at this time, if you go for expenditure reforms, what they're going to say to uh, 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 the people is that, you know, the, the, we are looking after the quality of money that we spend. The money, we, you know, get from them and the way we spend it, whether it's on development, whether it's on our pensions, whether it's on um, debt um, uh, payments, um, uh, it's on current expenditure, it's of the running of the civil government. So go for some kind of expenditure reforms that slow down the increase in um, um, uh, the, the rise of the expenditures. Your expenditures won't come down. Again, the other day I saw this news that, you know, let's cut expenditures. No, we don't want to cut expenditures. It's not possible. Everyone will come back to you and say, oh, oh we can't cut. What you're trying to cut is the rise in the uh, pensions, for example. And that itself will bring more semblance. So you do your expenditure reforms, and then you tell IMF that this time the taxation would not be the usual ones, the easy ones. Improve your GST, pick up your withholding taxes, you know, RDs, custom duties. 
just tell them this time that we will you know give us a target of getting you know so many retailers in the tax net um, putting so many pos machines um, you know it, it can't be fair right where um, 22% of my country is uh, based on agriculture um, in terms of gdp and i'm going to collect 2 to 4 billion rupees from the whole country so so tell them that we are going to gradually do our homework on that so when you start thinking like that the imf would fall in line um, be very very well prepared if you are not then yes you're going to do the uh, uh, so this is the biggest test you ask me what the biggest challenge is here's the biggest challenge for the government and this as a whole if they still do the same ramblings which a lot of governments in the world do uh, they come back to you and said you know straight jacket approach um, um, you know uh, 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 the cookie cutter approach imf what could we do we had to do this uh, then it will be business as usual a couple of years down the road we'd be arguing again on this but if they come up with the kind of approach that i have put to you then it would be you no know, we are taking ownership of this program this is our program these are our national economic reform agenda items that we are taking to them and you know take the ones that are palatable that are doable uh, maybe do them um, in a more staggered manner this time rather than up front uh, because already the inflation is killing people um, in terms of inflation go to the imf and ask them that you want to enhance your uh, bisp that's your best bet against inflation uh, because all the productivity challenges will take a lot of time so patavi saab if you go with this kind of mindset um i think you need to do serious work at home um i i want to see that work um, and i say that very openly i want to see the authorities put that work have a, a plan um, which they can communicate uh, um, uh, run it by other people um, run it by the country run it by the parliament have a broader ownership of the program so that everyone's on board with the program i mean the 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 discussion that we've done today is probably the most fundamental discussion that this country needs to have is what we are trying to do today Dr. Dr. Hakan, uh, obviously, you know, uh, you are someone who always been uh, looking towards uh, the teams that have been, uh, you know, negotiating with uh, the IMF. Uh, knowing the fact right now that uh, Mohammed Aurangzeb, who is going to be finance minister of Pakistan, and uh, knowing him that he's he's coming from a banking sector, uh, we have a precedent set in Pakistan. Of course, if we go back to uh, you know uh, Musharraf era, then we saw that uh, one of the bankers he was finance minister of Pakistan uh, before becoming the prime minister of Pakistan. I'm talking about Shokat mm. Aziz. and uh, he always has been considered as uh, more of a successful uh, uh, you know person uh, in terms of uh, uh, pakistan's uh, finance minister he's been considered as uh, one of the good finance minister of pakistan but uh, what we can say is that uh, during that time of course the situations were entirely different at that time we know that the uh, uh, pakistan was an ally to the us at that time and uh, we were getting uh, aid as well from uh, us at that time so all of these factors were uh, quite helpful towards the finance ministry at that time and of course uh, the things were uh, rather smooth at that time now of course situations are very different mm -hmm. and uh, if we are having another uh, finance minister who comes from the banking sector knowing the fact that he is uh, he was a pivotal part of the team that has been uh, you know negotiating with the IMF uh, uh, very recently what kind of comparison you being Uh, a, a maestro uh, on uh, you know finance sector and uh, being an economist uh, what do you think the uh, comparison would be and uh, what kind of uh, challenges uh, would be faced uh, by uh, mohammed aurangzeb uh, and dr sir uh, since uh, i'm told that we have limited time with you i want you to pass some numbers for us as well mm -hmm. particularly uh, uh, debt Uh, mm. how much of that is uh, uh, government of pakistan uh, owes to the domestic lenders particularly banks oh. and earlier when you were talking about bringing down the cost of uh, energy or handling um, energy inflation i thought that you were talking about divestment but we have heard that uh, government has actually instituted a study to check whether it is appropriate to pass on 
the control of discourse to the uh, provincial governments. Could you also comment on that? So, Patavi sahab, I'll take the easier question first, the provincialization. I'm not a fan. Um, I'm very clear on that. Uh, the federal government has more, um, what you say, wherewithal to run. And if we haven't been able to run, um, then, um, you know, 100 billion rupees of circular debt when General Musharraf left, 500 billion when PPP left, 1100 billion when PMLN left, um, 2300 when PTI left, uh, 2500 when PDM left, and now 2700. So if the federal government, um, with all the governments in place, um, has not been able to solve these issues, um, uh, provincialization probably is not going to do it. You have to um, go for uh, um, some kind of mixed um, you know, concessions and privatization. Um, uh, look at your telecom sector. So I'm quite clear. Once again, I think we've done this three times before. Uh, somehow the you know, people say we, we need to have continuity of policies. I'm exactly the opposite of that. I think we need to break away from this continuity. We've done these three times at least, maybe four times we've done this. And now we want to, again, study the provincialization. I'm quite clear that that's not something one should be thinking about. So so that's the easier one. On the, um, the, the first question was very important. The geostrategic rents for Pakistan, that time is over. So that's a tailwind that we had in 2013, 16, when we were doing this. Um, go back um, the era of um, the um, General Musharraf's time. Again, um, due to the circumstances, I can also tell you that there was a $12 billion Paris Club rescheduling that happened, which gave us actually the space where our debt to GDP from over 100, I think, came down to 56% or something um, of the GDP. Um, and so uh, uh, things became quite comfortable for Pakistan. Um, I think today, um, when you went to your friends for money before the IMF, they categorically said to you, go to the IMF, do the reforms, and we'll be with you. Um, I think even the closer ones, China, UAE, um, Qatar, um, Saudi Arabia, they all hinted towards that. One of the finance ministers I heard myself um, in Switzerland. So let's be um, quite clear. So yes, that may, makes the task of the incoming um, uh, government um, and not only the finance minister, all the important ministers, energy minister, um, the energy ministry, the privatization, the investment, all these folks, their task is very different. It's different and difficult. Um, in 2013, you should do the same thing that we did in 2013-16, um, because that remains to be the only time we were able to handle this. Um, and I remember we had a very, very clearly good team of sectoral experts. Eight PhDs would arrive tomorrow in Pakistan. I think there may be more than eight. Um, but Afi Saab, they've been to all the um, star universities. They all have advanced tertiary degrees. They sit 24-7 and model Pakistan. They use linear equations, econometric modeling, um, very sophisticated models that are given to them, backed by a number of um, uh, departments like FAD, macro. Uh, so, so this is the task. Now, you have to sit in front of them. You have to convince them that the story that you're telling them is backed by numbers, it's backed by data, you know your debt to GDP ratio, you know what is owed every year, you know, I mean, I, I was just making charts for Pakistan, what it owes for the next five years. Um, from my understanding, I have a talk on actually debt um, um, next week at a very important place. So I was making that chart, what is owed and how you're going to handle them. Um, Pakistan is a case for debt restructuring, debt reprofiling, um, looking at our maturities. Uh, so, you, so, so you go to them with that. Uh, this out of this $25 billion that I keep saying, a lot of it needs reprofiling, some needs recycling. So, you know, make your homegrown plan for that. Um, and that's going to be a tough task. Now, if the tailwind isn't there um, and you're going to be in, sitting in front of eight to 10 PhDs, you better have, you know, equally good people. I always say this to, you know, I said this to another country finance ministry the other day, and, and my take still remains the same. You know your country better than the folks that, who arrive. But the problem is that they have done much more work on the data than you have. So, you know, gear up, do that work, um, and, you know, come up to them and convince them that you want to do something other than what the straight jacket approach they are telling you. 
and maybe some of the adjustments you'll take from them, but some of the reforms you'll put to them. I really, really hope that we can do it this time. Otherwise, I, I, I don't want to see us complain of these, um, uh, you know, across the world, I listen to countries which, you know, they say that, you know, IMF gave us that, what can we do? That, that story is partially true. Um, your soft skills will matter in program negotiations. Your harmony between the team and Pakistan authorities will matter. Um, uh, uh, the multitudes of um, uh, uh, professionals who have to sign up on the dotted line would matter. So, you know, be, um, be, be really convincing. Um, my last sentence on this is, uh, you know, this is uh, the moment of truth for Pakistan. Nearly two dozen engagements within, with the fund. Um, have kept us dodge the deeper reforms and have left many of these programs incomplete. Our geostrategic position is different, um, and consequently, we are more exposed on the um, 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 external sector. Um, I really hope we can put this time, um, the work that is seriously needed, um, of adjustments, a credible program that we can build and get it financed. Um, Patafi Saab, in a day or two, you will see... Um, I have put together a program for Pakistan. It will be published in one of the newspapers. I will send you the um, cutting. And earlier, you were, you actually brought up your talk as well. So mm -hmm. whenever you give something like a TED talk or something, please do share with us. We can actually for, further propagate that as well. Yes. Mm. Okay. And uh, Dr. Farkhan, owing to uh, what you said earlier as well uh, regarding that we should put our house in order, and you also talked about continuity of policies. And uh, you said there should be out-of-the-box solutions this time. We should come up with something new, and uh, we should, we, instead of uh, blaming the IMF or talk giving others, uh, we should uh, think about our own policies and our own framework that we're going to take ahead. Uh, is, does, does that view also relate to the uh, privatization of the state-owned enterprises in Pakistan? And uh, Dr. Khakan, if you can allow me as well, uh, does it uh, reach to the point where, of course, we uh, are seeing that our uh, opposition, as you have earlier mentioned, that it is a very strong opposition. Mm -hmm. And looking at the current uh, internal uh, political situation of Pakistan, how uh, how bad uh, it is that it will be uh, sort of you know looked into deeply by the team you have mentioned that it is arriving tomorrow but according to my knowledge it is arriving tonight so uh, yeah the, it is arriving tonight they will be looking deep into our uh, uh, internal politics as well mm. sir and on lighter note doctor sir you keep on talking about uh, thinking out of the box where is this box that you keep talking about <laughs> I think, Faisal, on a lighter note, I would say if they arrive after 12 o'clock tonight, um, yeah. it'll be tomorrow. <laughs> That's why. <right. laughs> precisely, precisely right, sir. You are right. <laughs> and um, on, a, on a more serious note, Faisal, what you just said is very important, right? Um, so I'm going to read you a sentence out of the paper that I was writing. Experience shows that engagement with the domestic stakeholders, including the opposition, increases program effectiveness in countries. So that just is absolutely, take it to the parliament, you know, at least if you don't want to, uh, uh, and, and you know, I mean, we um, uh, as a nation have given a split mandate um, where all the three big parties have taken a bigger, uh, a, a big chunk. So, uh, you know, at least put it in front of the parliament even, and you can be very, very open this time and, and tell them that this is what we are discussing, this is what we are agreeing. So at least if they have some reservations, they, they, they should come up with that. And especially after, uh, you know, um, the, the, uh, that IMF has been engaging with all the political parties. So that becomes very important. I'm, I'm really glad I forgot that point, so Faisal, you uh, brought that up um, the, on the privatization front. Uh, uh, um, in 2010, um, um, again, I'll take one minute, one of the CEOs came to my office and said, you know, I don't understand. Am I a state-run organization? Am I a, a, a SOE? What is my status? And, you know, there we realized that this is the kind of unclear position we have of our SOEs. Um, the top SOEs which were loss making in the first report I wrote, um, and it is lying on the finance website with my signatures, we said the top 10 were mainly the discos, PIAs, uh, uh, NHA, and all these. Today, even, Finance Ministry has done a good job of publishing another current report of, I think, uh, data 21, 22. Uh, the, the top loss making are still the same. So uh, uh, start your privatization agenda. Uh, on that, I have a very particular view, and it's even stronger than um, any other area. Privatization is an area 
which is very, very highly technical. Uh, when you need to financially restructure PIA, when you want to bifurcate PIA, um, when you want to get rid of the HR or handle the HR, when you want to see how the open skies policy will play, you know, I mean, the, the, there is massive work involved. Revamp your privatization commission. Bring a chairperson who's, you know, the lady who's been doing some work on privatization across the world. You know, bring these people along. Uh, pay them heavy salaries and, you know, get the technical work. If you get such solid technical work, then only can you go to the cabinet and the parliament and sell this. So, whereas privatization needs I'm, to be I'm, done. I'm glad, Dr. Sab, you're talking about private, uh, privatization. And Rafi, with your permission, I have yes, a follow-up question. Yes. Regarding uh, the post of privatization minister, yes. sir, in the past we have seen that most of the in cabinets, people who were, uh, you know, this uh, position was offer, offered only as a placeholder. Somebody would actually sit there and that's what, that was it. This time they have gone for Adim Khan, mm. who is a doer. We know that he has been delivering in the past as well, especially in Punjab province. Do you think that uh, he can put together the team that you were talking about? And uh, in coming days, perhaps um, it also shows the seriousness uh, the, the government attaches to the idea of privatization. So, you know, I think he's a private sector entrepreneur, so he understands these things. Um, and he should, uh, you know, understand the importance of uh, the kind of uh, experts in every area that are required. So let's really hope that we can do that. Um, many a times we've not been able to do privatization. My sense is our technical will was missing. And then um, being a politician, they, the, the, all the political um, setup should be able to muster that kind of political support as well. But that, I think, still will be secondary. The first thing is to prepare all these um, 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 organizations for privatization. And Patapi sahab, it's even deeper than that. You know, many places you would need to s s revamp the regulatory frameworks. So it's not only the operations that we need to clean up. Many areas would require regulatory cleanups. So you, you, you would need to be uh, doing that. Many areas would require government taking, you know, a big chunk of what is owed and guaranteed by the state on the books of PIA. So uh, then you need to, you know, involve uh, how to handle the debt situation there because your debt will immediately rise by a couple of hundred billion rupees as you clean up PIA. So how is that going to work? How is that going to be compensated? All these interministerial issues. So really hoping that the team at privatization, I mean team everywhere, but the team at privatization would be a first class one, highly paid people, good consultants, you know, good leadership. And, and you know, and we, we can move forward to curtail the hundreds and billion rupees of losses by paying, you know, a, a, a couple of million rupees in salaries. Uh, we should not be, you know, what they say, pound foolish and, you know, um, um, uh, penny, penny wise pound. kind. Yeah. Penny wise. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. Uh, Dr. Khan Najib, unfortunately, we're short on time and we'll have to wrap up the so first segment. Thankful. And uh, we highly appreciate your views and the time you've taken out to be a part of the discussion. Of course, it was uh, very, very good to hear your views and, of course, very articulate with your views. Uh, with that, always. Always. Uh, as always. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your time and being part of the discussion. With that, we'll move towards our second uh, segment where we'll talk about the Gaza situation and the ceasefire. Of course, it's very devastating <coughs> as we see uh, footages uh, coming from there as we hear the, uh, the devastation that is unfolding there as part of Israel's genocidal actions. And in that regard, we also saw South Africa moving a case against Israel in the International Court of Justice. There were talks of ceasefire. Uh, there were also talks in the United Nations uh, Security Council and the General Assembly regarding the provision of humanitarian assistance. But we've seen that Israel has been restricting access to that assistance. And um, as we now know that uh, US, Qatar and Egypt were pushing for a ceasefire between the two parties that uh, should, have, uh, should have concluded before the start of the holy month of Ramadan. But of course, as we know and we have heard the statements coming in that it is not possible and there are hurdles that are not being addressed and are not being, uh, and the, those hurdles both the parties cannot move on from and the mediators are having a very tough time in regard to that as well. Uh, Raja Faisal, what's your views on uh, the prevailing situation in Gaza, the devastation that is going on there, and how it is converting into a humanitarian catastrophe, and how the ceasefire is very important because it's been more than five months of war now? 
Sir Rafi, there is only one word and that is genocide. Genocide is taking place and who's uh, you know facilitating it and who's conducting it? Of course we know that Netanyahu and his devilish forces, mm. they are conducting it and the arms they are using, unfortunately, a country like uh, America, USA and the Western world who obviously claim to be the champions of democracy, the champions of human rights, mm. the champions of, uh, uh, you know, every, uh, every bit that is good, considered good in the world, they, they consider themselves as champions. Mm. And they are the ones who are actually facilitating. Their bombs are being dropped on the people of Gaza. And uh, at the same time, what we see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, portraying the double standards, what they do is they send the aid as well. But right after aid is dropped and people are, uh, you know, going to get that aid from the roads, uh, at, the, at the same time, bombs are being dropped and then bombs are labeled as made in USA and mm. made in, you know, uh, any Western country how pathetic it is and none of them countries is coming forward to actually force Israel, force Israel to have uh, a talk uh, uh, with the Gazans and sit with them and of course negotiate peace. What we see, uh, Rafe, is that when we see something taking place in East Timor or if we see uh, taking something, uh, happening something in South Sudan, Suddenly, we see all of these powerful, uh, uh, you know, countries, they appear and they say that, oh, you need to, by force, they say it, they, that you need to have negotiation, mm. peace negotiation must take place. Here, situation is entirely different. Even United Nations observers, to observe what has had happened, I mean, the claims which were uh, uh, made by Israel initially, I mean, nobody bothered going there and checking whether them claims were original or not. Mm. Whereas we saw that in later uh, days, I mean, they themselves, their claims, claim after claim was actually considered as a fake claim. I mean, they claimed that uh, rapes were conducted by, um, you know, the other forces, uh, the Hamas forces. Nothing took place of that nature. They claimed that uh, babies were killed and slaughtered and uh, thrown in the fire. Nothing of that nature uh, taken place. Yes, few of the abductions were taken place. Mm. And that is true. I mean, they kept them uh, uh, abductees with them. And with the time while they were negoti uh, negotiating peace with the uh, Israel, they uh, set few free as well. And mm. once they came out, they simply said that we were not maltreated there. We were we were taken care of. Whereas people of Gaza who were who were uh, uh, you know taken hostage mm. by these brutal force of Israel, the satanic force I must say, the devilish force I must say, they have been of course uh, you know brutalizing them and they have been showing them how a devil uh, is in the play and nobody is taking care of it and. Now, uh, I mean, we are at a point where uh, we have a force and we have a government of Netanyahu that is not listening to the world. I mean, mm. the sanity is not prevailing. Countries like Western countries and US, they must step in. United Nations must step in and they, they must force uh, peace out there. Because uh, what we are seeing is, I mean, uh, uh, the Gazans, they are obviously restricted only into North Gaza, a tiny strip now. Rest of whole Gaza is actually in the hands of uh, Israel. Mm. And Israel has actually conducted uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, genocide there. And at the same time, they have started, uh, you know, uh, uh, spreading pamphlets as well, saying that we are going to make uh, another, uh, you know, developing or for the Jews and they will be actually coming to live here. This is Zionism which is at play. This has nothing to do with any religion, be it Muslim, be it uh, Jewish uh, faith or be it Christianity. It has nothing to do with the faiths. Mm. Zionism is a political struggle, a political struggle that actually initiated in the later uh, uh, phase of uh, the 19th century and that is in the play and they are the ones who are actually controlling Israel. 
people of Israel, I'm talking about the Jews themselves, they are protesting against their own government because yeah. they know that this is wrong, whatever is happening. Hmm. Zionism is at its play, full-fledged play, and we know that there are, uh, uh, you know, few of the Western leaders as well who have in past claimed, uh, you know, boastfully that they are, uh, you know, Zionists. I mean, I'm talking about U.S. Uh, president, U.S. president himself, Joe mm. Biden, said it once that you don't need to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Mm. He himself claimed that he's a Zionist. So yeah. all of these claims, I mean, this madness must stop now. Even the roads and uh, people of USA, they are coming out on the roads, uh, you know, demanding peace to be restored in Gaza because mm. right now, of course, starvation. I mean, uh, yesterday I was going through one of the news that 25 kids under 10, they have died just because of starvation. There is n nothing for them to eat and not a single, uh, you know, convoy of uh, medical supplies was uh, allowed to enter in there. They don't have medical supplies. They don't have food. They're they, bombing hospitals. They, they're bombing hospitals. I mean, hospitals are, they, there's only one or two active hospitals right now left. Rest of all, they've been demolished, literally demolished. And uh, I mean, nobody is, uh, you know, paying any heed to it. This madness must stop now. United Nations must intervene. Countries like USA, they must listen to their own people, the masses that are actually, they are American people standing mm. outside their uh, White House demanding their government to intervene for the sake of peace. They are not Muslims or they are not, you know, uh, Jews only. They are even Christians. They are demanding peace to be restored in mm. there. So I think, uh, you know, this madness must end and sanity must prevail now. We are talking about millions of people. There was time in previous century when we used to obviously uh, mm. talk about Auschwitz and we always used to uh, say that humanity must, uh, 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 must have been, you know, uh, realizing at that time to intervene because uh, uh, at that time, of course, Jews were uh, murdered in there hmm. in daylight and nobody stopped it. Now is the time the world must intervene and millions of people who are at large in Gaza, uh, they, must not, they must not see their death to be conducted like this. Uh, Gaza is open air Auschwitz right now and who's doing it is the Zionism that is at its play hmm. and Zionists, they are doing it and that must be stopped. Right, uh, Farooq, your views as the Raja Faisal mentioned that the United Nations must step in, the ICJ must step in, the world community must take notice. I mean, uh, the United Nations has taken notice, uh, but uh, um, uh, there was still, Israel did not heed to what the United Nations had to say, and they criticized the Secretary General uh, regarding the ICJ's ruling. They did not pay as much attention to that. And I'm, uh, what I'm failing to understand is, that uh, there's, there's accusations against Israel regarding its committing genocide against the Palestinian people, but Israel is not even paying heed to being answerable to the world community. And uh, what's your take on all this? Um, how to hold Israel accountable? How to hold Netanyahu accountable for his actions before going towards the ceasefire? Right, Rafi, uh, earlier when uh, uh, Raja Faisal was talking about uh, um, this whole thing, he was mentioning or referring to it uh, as genocide. I think something even bigger than that is yeah. happening, and that is ethnic cleansing mm. of Palestinians from Gaza. And if you want to see how heartless, how uh, you know um, horrible a uh, worldview is in, uh, among uh, various politicians, just listen to Nikki Haley, yeah. who says that uproot them all and send them to other countries which are pro Hamas. And I'm talking about children. I'm talking about infants who are being killed, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she doesn't mind even displacing them just to placate Netanyahu. Uh, now, uh, Raja Faisal again uh, just spoke about Zionism. You have to understand that even something more, uh, you know, focused than that is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, uh, at this moment, is, uh, remember, Zionism, when it was originally conceived, was only a demand for a homeland for Jewish people. Yeah. And there was uh, there were certain uh, aspects to it which were legitimate, uh, but uh, then we what we saw now recently what we have seen is that ben Benjamin Netanyahu himself, because uh, he has been plagued with the accusations of corruption, 
He has been losing popularity, and his popularity has sunk so low that um, he has repeatedly kept on dissecting and reuniting or rearranging or reorganizing the, fund, uh, the uh, fundamentalist or right-wing extremist. Mm. At this moment, the government that they have is the farthest of the far-right uh, far government True. there. And then he has uh, actually, uh, usually it is thought that uh, people like uh, Netanyahu actually bank on um, American Jewry uh, to, uh, to get their support. That is not true because those people are living there. Mm. What he does is he has actually built uh, alliances with far right, some neo Nazi elements as well. Hindutva. Right. Why, uh, um, yeah, Hindutva is in India, but I'm talking about America, right? Mm. Uh, you know, for neo Nazis also. There is a website, for neo Nazi website, who calls, you know, um, uh, his son, Yaya. Uh, their favorite Jew because he keeps on, you, you know, uh, d dividing the jury on this line. So who is actually ally allies of Netanyahu right now in America? Primarily evangelists. Why? Because Christian, uh, Christian Zionists actually think that it, Israel has to be fattened up so that when the second coming of Jesus Christ uh, happens, hmm. at that time he can destroy it and then end of times can continue. So these people have actually used that kind of thing. What exactly can be done right now? Hmm. Of course, uh, uh, you know, preventing Western weapons from reaching Israel at a time when it is uh, indulging in mass murder is very important. And that's why we see a pushback from within uh, hmm. the US as well. And the Congress is also protesting parts yeah. of it at least. But after that, what exactly needs to be done? Uh, now you, you brought up ICJ's uh, you know, uh, proceedings and in that we saw some element of moral clarity where they at least said, uh, like Tree Beard from uh, Lord of the Rings, that after so much deliberation they thought that maybe they are committing genocide. Right? Yeah. Uh, after that, of course, there are going to be consequences, but what is important is, A, there is a month of Ramzan and in Ramzan, People are already, you know, they are fasting and then they are being subjected to this totality as well. <coughs> it has to stop. Yeah. Before coming to the program, I saw uh, DCIA, the head of CIA, uh, his statement actually that we haven't given up on the idea of ceasefire during Ramzan. I hope something of that uh, sort happens. But again, test of international law, international order is not to actually punish uh, those who are not your own, but to punish that you think are yours. And that is where Netanyahu has been actually exploiting the loopholes because West is not geared to punish Israel, right? Mm. Punish Israeli government. Right. Today, if the war stops, Netanyahu goes out of government. If he goes out of government, first thing that happens is the Supreme Court actually indicts him and sends him to prison. So it is a hostage crisis. But that man has actually poisoned the blood, poisoned the minds of so many young Israelis as well, that when you look at the operation that is going on in Gaza, or the war, mm. what happens is the nearby mountains, people actually take their sofas there yeah. and yeah. eat popcorns watching what is going on. Yeah. With that kind of a totality, if tomorrow it is going to come full circle, will you actually say that you are the victim? how much victimhood there has to be before the world has to realize that something wrong is going on. Well, um, very rightly put, and of course, uh, we all hope there's an end to such devastation and sanity prevails and all these quarters that are, uh, that are watching and all those that, uh, that have a sane rationale mindset, they can condemn and hold accountable and, hold and, and also take initiatives to put an end uh, to this injustice and genocide and ethnic cleansing that is uh, taking place. Unfortunately, we're short on time. I'm glad to conclude in the first segment uh, today. We talked about Pakistan's talks with the IMF. We had uh, economist Dr. Khakar Najib with us, and uh, he shared his very articulate views on the topic. In the second segment, we talked about the Gaza situation and the ceasefire talks. And of course, um, uh, we had with us in the studios of uh, senior analyst Farooq Petafi. And uh, we were joined uh, by geopolitical analyst uh, Raja Faisal. With that, we conclude today's episode. See you same time tomorrow. Till then, take care.